I'm Josh Young. Today, we're going to explore AI, and we're going to see why it is not a threat to any of our jobs. AI is enhancing most aspects of clinical medicine, including diagnosis and risk group identification, image assistance, clinical calculations, things like IOL powers, and noise reduction in the diagnostic devices that we use. But will these models that are so good at diagnosis and management supplant traditional clinical judgment? Even if the algorithms do not literally replace us, will they remove our agency, dictating to us what to do and when to do it? Will deviation from AI recommendations put us at medical legal peril? Before we talk about what AI is, let's define what AI is not. Clinical heuristic systems have existed for a long time. Indeed, what a lot of us call evidence-based medicine distills to heuristic algorithms. There are two important weaknesses in heuristic systems. The first is that they do not change when the data change. The evidence is treated as if it is some sort of unassailable truth when in fact new evidence arises all the time. I know what you're going to say, Josh, as we get new evidence, we build new heuristics, but that is recommending that we discard an existing model and build an entirely new one when new clinical data are gathered. That's equivalent to discarding your third grade child because she doesn't know fourth grade math. The second way in which heuristic systems are problematic can be illustrated with an old joke. A policeman sees a drunk man searching for something under a street light and asks the drunk what he has lost. He says he's lost his keys and they both look under the street light together. After a few minutes, the policeman asks if he's sure he lost his keys here and the drunk replies no and that he lost them in the park. The policeman asks why he's searching here and the drunk replies this is where the light is. I'm going to define AI as a mathematical algorithm that evolves when presented with new data. That is to say, it learns. The idea of AI may be new, but we have, in our quotidian lives, dealt with and been part of algorithms that learn. The Soviet command economy was heuristically determined. Prices, supply, labor, were all dictated by a defined set of rules created by the Central Committee. As broadly as planners looked, they could only consider factors that they themselves deemed worthy of consideration, thereby suffering from the street lamp problem. Contrast this with the market economy in which factors may contribute to a price whether we a priori believe them to be relevant or not. Witness underproduction in computer chips that resulted in increased demand for U-Haul trucks by tourists in Hawaii last year. The market is an AI that calculates the price of commodities and of labor. The market learns by ingesting new data. And as we shall also see when we consider computer AI, the market is difficult to explain. AI should be thought of as a spectrum with mathematical techniques like linear regression that minimize error based upon data as being just outside. We here used terms machine learning and artificial intelligence sometimes interchangeably. No hard border separates the two, but authors tend to use ML to mean techniques that are on the left of the spectrum and AI for techniques that are on the right. Certainly, you would not be at fault for using either term for any of the methods I will discuss. Let's begin our exploration with support vector machines. These are algorithms used to, de to define boundaries between different populations, say patients with a pathology and patients without, or patients who respond to a treatment and patients who don't. Support vector machines are all about drawing borders. 
and the best analogy is that of a map. We will take it as our task to draw a border that can be applied to mark the separation between land and water. Our objective is to determine a border that can be generalized, that is to say, that can be applied to different data sets and still perform well. In artificial intelligence, the data are divided into a training set and a test set. One common methodology is called cross-validation, in which the data set is divided into different pieces. The particular part of data used for testing is then rotated amongst these pieces as the remaining data are used for training. Here, I've divided a political map of the world into six pieces for us to perform six-fold cross-validation. We will make our first pass at creating a border on this first set of data. The line we draw is excellent at separating that portion of the map that has land from that portion that is water. If all the data sets were identical to this one, our job would be done. Let's move on to the next slice. Translating our border to the second slice highlights some of the problems of machine learning. Although the initial border performed well in the first data set, it performs poorly in the second one. The first border was, as we say, overfit to the data. Overfit results perform well with one data set, but are not generalizable to other data sets. We adjust our border based upon new data. Note that this data set is so different from the first one that performance is poor even with the adjustment. However, as further data are ingested, a border can be drawn that performs relatively well for most of the data sets. This is a trial and error. This trial and error process is the hallmark of AI learning. In the end, the border is drawn that performs well with most of the data and demonstrates the fact that we already know that most of the landmass of the Earth is in the Northern Hemisphere. This is an illustration of two-dimensional data in which borders can be drawn to separate one population from another. In real clinical machine learning, the data are multi-parametric and envelopes are calculated within this multi-dimensional space that attempt to segregate the population of interest. Support vector machines are used widely in medicine generally and in ophthalmology in particular. And here I want to begin to address what is known as technological unemployment, the loss of jobs caused by technological change, and to highlight that this concern is nothing new. I will make an argument that you have nothing to fear from clinical AI and that you, as clinicians, will not be replaced. My argument consists of three observations. The first of these is that, while AI learns, it does not learn the way you do. We humans do not learn primarily by trial and error. You did not learn to diagnose cataracts by randomly naming diagnoses until your attending said correct. We humans do not require huge data sets to develop judgment. This does not make AI any less powerful, but rest assured, it makes it less threatening. The next class of machine learning are the boosted regressions. These algorithms take an iterative approach to minimizing error in defining the trajectory of data in a multi-dimensional set. The graph on the right shows the trend line and the one on the left shows the minimization of error. This minimization turns out to be a difficult problem. The reason this is true is that local minima may exist and may fool the algorithm into believing that it has achieved the lowest possible error when in fact a more substantial minimum may exist elsewhere. This is a fascinating topic but not one on which I will spend any more time today. Allow me to talk about my own work as an example of boosted regression. 
We examined an enormous data set of 87 million patients in an attempt to identify those non-ophthalmic parameters that might identify patients at risk for ophthalmic pathology in order to facilitate referral of these patients to an ophthalmologist. We found that the machine learning approach that worked best was XGBoost, a boosted regression algorithm. It was not obvious to us at the start that this sort of AI approach would be best. Rather, 90 models were created and the XGBoost approach proved the most successful. Another approach to machine learning is the iteratively determined decision tree, such as a J48 or a C4.5. As an example, I was asked to speak as a visiting professor at Yale and gave the attendees the task of playing a cataract simulator before my lecture and then again sometime after the lecture. I did this to assess whether my lecture affected any change in the thinking of the attendees. The approach I used was decision tree modeling, which determines the relationship between parameters in the doctor's decision-making process. And here I wish to digress. I'm going to ask you as an ophthalmologist, or perhaps even as a retinologist, uh, who is well-read and adept at making retinal diagnoses to make a quantitative assessment for me. So in your estimation, how big is this horse? Of course, I'm asking an unfair question. For each of us, our knowledge is not infinitely broad, but I will represent to you this. A retinologist's ability to guess the height and weight of a horse is better than the ability of a diabetic maculopathy trained AI to recognize age-related macular degeneration. The intelligence of AI systems is very narrow and cannot be generalized beyond its very specific area of training. Think of AI as a very clever animal that can learn a trick. To believe that a diabetic macular edema trained AI understands what it is doing is equivalent to teaching a dog to shake hands and believing you have instilled manners in it. This narrowness is an active field of research in AI today as effort is made to combine different models to produce multivalent AIs. Indeed, it is even a challenge to combine different instantiations of the same model. Let's say we want to combine a glaucoma model trained at NYU with the same model trained at Mount Sinai and at Columbia. We don't want to pass electronic medical record data between institutions. Instead, we can combine the trained features of each model to create a super model without having to move gigabytes of data or to imperil PHI. This is called federated learning. Combining models is also an active area of research. Here, I will demonstrate swarm learning. Uh, I, I'm going to now ask for, for four volunteers uh, to illustrate a different way in which models can, can be combined. So I ask you to choose amongst each other to bring four people up here while I get things ready. Oh, come on, you people. I volunteer, Dr. Odell. Dr. Odell, I would like you to join us. I need people who are not experts in AI. Okay. Well, then okay. I'm going to Even though I've written several papers about the topic, I would still and, be a volunteer. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you nope. to, to, to no, join us. No, next question. Please. And perhaps, you don't uh, know. Oh, good. And uh, Dr. Liebman. I just want one of those buttons, uh, that's all. Yes, no. Yes. 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 Okay. And we're going to use this AI friendship. Uh, okay, so I need two people on this side. Okay. And two on that side. And each of you has a little handle here. Take a handle. Take a handle, Jeffrey. Okay. Now, we're talking about the height and mass of this horse. And I really want you guys to get it right. So manipulate 
the uh, little arms to get the arrow to point to what you think the height of the shoulder is and the man's is. I'll take your lead. Go on, let's oh, let, let's see. Should we cut first or just do it? Just do it. I, I <laughs> want to. It's, it's, it's a show, fake. It's going to be a pony. Show me your. No, 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 no. It's a big this, horse. This is a big horse. This is a Shire horse. Uh, 2,200 is the top for a horse. 2,200 pounds. So that's 1,100 kilograms. It's going to be max. I would say less than that. Maybe 950. And let's go. Yeah, like right here. Height at the shoulder. Yeah, like like here. Okay. Let's get right. So, okay, so I, I, I have to first, first of all, let, let's be so the price is right. This is great. Come on now. You're the nice. You guys were easy to convince. Yes, yes. Is that part of AI? You can say we're convinced. Absolutely, <laughs> it is. And that is exactly what I wanted to demonstrate. So there is, here you go. May I give you this? You, you, you're, 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 and oh, I can join me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. That was absolutely wonderful. Swarm learning takes into account the confidence that each model has that it is performing correctly. For many people outside of the field, neural networks are synonymous with AI. Indeed, neural networks are playing an increasing role. Neural networks, at their most basic, consist of an input or ingestion layer and an output layer, and a variable number of hidden layers between. Each of the elements of the hidden layer has a number of adjustable weights it applies to the signals it receives from each of the elements that feeds it, and to each element it itself feeds. The networks can be quite complicated, with hidden layers much larger than either the input or output layer, and both feed forward and feed back of the signal. These networks learn by adjusting the variable weights of each element and seeing whether these changes affect the accuracy of the output. We want the output to predict the appropriate outcome, what we call the ground truth. Neural networks can be used to interpret parametric data, but they're best known as a means to interpret images. This is often accomplished by adding one or more layers that consolidate information from adjacent pixels. We call these special consolidation layers convolutions. We want the neural network output to correctly identify a target, like an object, a person's face, a contraband item, or a diagnosis like diabetic retinopathy. How is the target or diagnosis identified in the training set? How do we get the ground truth? Ground truth can be established by having experts review training images or by this minor digression. In the late 18th century, a device captivated society. The Mechanical Turk was a chess-playing automaton loved by no less than Napoleon and Benjamin Franklin. The device played chess brilliantly by means of only a clockwork mechanism. How is this possible? It wasn't. The Mechanical Turk was a sham. A small person sat within its box and manually moved controls to play the game. This integration of man and machine with man serving the machine has been, cynically, adopted as the name of a ground truth labeling service you can hire from Amazon. In a dystopian version of envelope stuffing, anyone can sign up with Amazon to label images as a side gig. But not all AI requires labeled data. Unsupervised neural network learning, or deep learning, consists of giving the algorithm data and an objective. The algorithm finds its own way to meet the objective. This approach has essentially solved the problem of protein folding. It is this strategy, applied by a Google model, that achieved superhuman performance in chess, and most recently, in Go. However, the process 
of these hidden layers remains inscrutable. The problem of explaining how a diagnosis is made by a neural network, that is, by what criteria a diagnosis is made, is called the problem of explainability. I distinguish two explainability problems, the small problem of explainability and the large problem. It is not immediately clear what parts of the image are important to the model. What is the model homing in on when it makes a diagnosis of BRVO? This is the small problem of explainability and can be largely answered by employing heat maps, overlays of test images that highlight the determinative areas. But a much larger problem exists. If I were to ask any of you the criteria by which you diagnose a BRVO, you would speak in terms of vessels and nerve fiber layer. The algorithm does not think in these terms. It is a dog that has learned to raise its paw. This is a picture of jellyfish. I'll take a volunteer. Uh, I'm going to call on you, Scott, because you've been hounding me for graphics. Uh, for uh, for book chapters, and now I get to have a little payback. <laughs> so uh, this is that same picture of the jellyfish, and wait, I'm going to give you a nice pink pen. Uh, I'm going to ask you to make this picture more dog. Make it more dog. Make it more dog. Yes, it's not it's jellyfish right, right now. Make it more dog. Go ahead, draw. Do do your do your best. <laughs> you just you draw didn't see that one coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and the signature. That's 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 thing. All right, I see. Yes, thank you. Okay, and I am. I need. Mean, wait a minute, Scott. I have to give you. Here, how do we how do we? Okay, and I mean, this is the last opportunity to, to volunteer this next one. I need someone to make it even more. You get this nice bright green marker. Thank you. More dog. Make it even more dog. This is, apparently, this is dog. We want to make it even more dog. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave this for that. And this is uh, your payment. <laughs> this same question was asked to a neural network trained to identify dogs. The image was fed in reverse through the network to make this picture more dog. This is more dog. What is missing here? It is the conception of what a dog is. This is even more dog, and this is how a similar algorithm might identify AMD. The truth is that even if the algorithm could explain how it makes a diagnosis, these explanations would not be of any use to us. This is random noise fed through the same dog identification network, and it is my final slide. This is the real reason AI will not replace you. It is because algorithms have no conception of the world, of the distinct entity of a retinal venule, of an eye, of a pathology. AI is and will be a wonderful tool, a genuine revolution in clinical care, but it will not be a doctor any more than a dog will learn etiquette.